Welcome everyone to this webinar on common infections in general practice, helping your registrar make the best decision. And this is part two of a two-part series uh, on common infections in general practice. My name's Simon Morgan. I'm a medical educator with GPSA and a GP here in Newcastle. And our e content expert tonight is Professor Josh Davis. Josh is an infectious diseases physician at the John Hunter Hospital here in Newcastle and a clinical research fellow at the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin. His research focuses on clinical trials in common severe infections, including staph bacteremia, severe sepsis and bone and joint infections. I think very importantly for this webinar, uh, he comes with a, an expertise uh, as being part of the writing group of Therapeutic Guidelines Antibiotics and is the immediate past president of the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, ACID. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Simon. We at GPSA would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which this meeting is taking place and pay our respects to their elders past, present and their families. And the same learning objective as last time, we are going to be really focusing on your role as supervisors to support your registrars best managing common infections in general practice, I guess assessment and investigation and management. Last week, for those of you who I guess weren't here and would be interested to see the webinar, it's, it's up on the GPSA website. We talked about some of the, um, I guess, current evidence around management of urinary tract infections uh, in terms of recurrent infections and uh, asymptomatic management uh, or asymptomatic in, um, bacteriuria. Uh, we also talked about skin and soft tissue infection. And this week we have a GI and a respiratory focus. Uh, and I guess we talked a little bit uh, in terms of prefacing why we're running these webinars last week. And this is really just to touch on it again very common presentation in Australian general practice. This is beach data, so commonly seen, I guess, for ourselves, but probably increasingly so for registrars, uh, a lot of diagnostic uncertainty. One of the things I didn't talk about, and I think Josh will draw out tonight, is just that sense of if I miss something, if I don't treat something, is it actually going to um, result in the patient coming to harm and maybe getting much more sick than they might have and ending up in hospital? And indeed, so many of these infections are self-limiting, um, but I guess, you know, occasionally there is, um, they lead, lead to serious illness. And we know, and what really is underpinning these two webinars is trying to look at rational um, antibiotic stewardship and reducing the amount of inappropriate antibiotics that are prescribed. We'll be talking and referencing the therapeutic guidelines a lot tonight, and this is a freely available, although I think most of us have ready access to ETG, but a freely available uh, resource for antibiotic prescribing in primary care, and probably not a bad desktop resource to have uh, available and certainly um, to talk to your registrars about. But we shall start with a case. Uh, we've got a number. We've got a busy waiting room today. Um, everyone's appropriately socially distanced and wearing their surgical masks, but they're all waiting to come in. And Stuart is our first patient. And Stuart tells you that he's got this sort of years long history of episodic loose stools and abdominal pain. Nothing too kind of concerning sounding. And indeed, four years ago, I had a colonoscopy and it was, it was essentially normal. And he's got a history of IBS. You know him quite well. Um, and he's had no red flags along the way. But he actually ends up seeing your registrar and they call you with the results of a stool multiplex PCR that they've, I guess, enthusiastically done for uh, ongoing sort of symptoms that Stuart's been worried about. And it shows blastocystis species. And I guess I'd be interested in chat while we're looking at this, who's come across this result? Because I'd be very surprised if you haven't. So how would you manage Stuart? How would you ask your registrar, or support your registrar to manage Stuart, I guess? Ignore it. It's common. We see it all the time. You know, there's a question mark about its disease-causing capacity. No, no, I'd treat it with some uh, a stat dose, uh, you know, a couple of um, grams of metronidazole. No, it probably needs a week of the stuff. How about retesting? And, um, you know, if you really don't know, uh, perhaps the registrar can call somebody friendly like Josh. 61, two-thirds of you would actually ignore this result, um, but some of you certainly would be treating this, uh, indeed, with some with a standard course, and there's a little bit of um, uncertainty out there too. Would you retest? Might you call your friendly ID physician? So, Josh, what does blastocystis mean to, uh, to us as primary care practitioners? 
I'll, I'll come to that in a sec. I'm just going to touch on multiplex stool PCR first and, and why we should be probably using it a bit more sparingly than people sometimes do. So there are multiplex PCR, as most people probably know, means a PCR that detects more than one target. The more targets you add into a PCR, the more complicated it is to design properly and the more likely you are to get false negatives and occasionally false positives as well. There's panels from different companies ranging from 6 to 22 targets, meaning organisms. Most of the Australian labs have something like the list on the right here. So it gives you a lot of information and often information you didn't even need to know. And it doesn't replace culture because you can't do antibiotic susceptibility testing. So, for example, people might be aware there's been, there's been an outbreak of antibiotic resistance, Shigella, causing diarrhoea in the last few years, mostly in men who have sex with men. Um, and you wouldn't know that from a PCR, just shows that Shigella's there. Um, and same with typhoid, if you have a patient with typhoid that's often drug resistant. So it doesn't replace culture, but it is a lot faster than and more, and more sensitive than culture. But the, the other problem is it include targets that it's probably better not to know about. Diantamoeba fragilis is a bit more of a grey area. It, it, it probably is a pathogen in some cases, and there are some patients who improve if you find diantamoeba fragilis and treat it. But there's multiple conflicting studies, some showing no benefit of treating, some showing some benefit. Blastocystis hominis, on the other hand, there's a pretty strong consensus that it's really not a pathogen. It's present in the stools of 5 to 40% of the general population, and the higher percentages are in generally in lower middle-income countries or places with poorer sanitation and, and sewer services. And ironically, it's more commonly found in the bowel of healthy people than sick ones. In other words, when you get diarrhea and disturbed flora, it's less likely to be found. And so it's probably just a marker of exposure to contaminated fertile water rather than a pathogen. The, these multiplex stool PCRs, the commercial pathology companies are pushing them because they, they make a fair bit of money out of them. And as a result, there's been a bit of a sort of mini epidemic of blastocystis being diagnosed and, and then probably inappropriately treated. Um, so when should you do do this. But the, the hospital lab now, because of basically for staffing and economic reasons, they don't even do culture except for very special circumstances if you, if you ask nicely. So they, if, you are, if you send a stool, they'll just routinely PCR it. But when should you send a stool? So if someone's got acute diarrhea, most people don't need a stool to be sent because most acute diarrhea is self-limiting. If it's lasting more than two weeks, then it, it's is justifiable to test um, because they may have something like Giardia or Cryptosporidium. Or if they've got diarrhea that's so bad that they need to be admitted to hospital or that they've got blood and fever associated with it, worth testing. For chronic diarrhea, really only worthwhile if it's associated with red flags like Simon mentioned our patient didn't have. And finally, if you're investigating an, outbra in, an outbreak, for example, in a nursing home for public health reasons. So, Josh, um, you mentioned that it doesn't replace culture and, and microscopy. Are we ordering, should we be ordering both these tests then in these instances? It, it sort of depends on the context. So most of the private pathology companies, mainly for commercial reasons, because they can bill for both, they encourage you to ask, request both, yep. um, MCS and PCR if you send a stool to them. The hospital lab um, will actually refuse to do culture unless you give them a special reason why. So the reason might be, I suspect typhoid or this patient has risk factors for Shigella or something. So it kind of depends which lab you're sending it to and you can take advice from your lab. Yeah, and actually it's interesting because um, Malcolm's asked a question about C. diff. He actually ends up getting a course of metronidazole, maybe your registrar didn't call you and went to um, ETG and interpreted it because I think there might be something about its, uh, I don't know how clear the guidance is in, in, in the guidelines. Josh, maybe you can advise on that. He ends up going to another GP who gives him a seven-day course of cotrimoxazole and, in fact, gets much worse and ends up having another test that shows C. diff. He relapses after a peak course of metronidazole and indeed ended up being treated with oral vancomycin, which I gather is second line for C. diff and eventually returns back to his baseline IBS. So he's had rather a stormy course for um, what potentially was a, an investigation that wasn't warranted in the first place. 
Josh, I might actually ask you very quickly about a, a, this question that's come in. So my registrar ordered a, a C. diff and the patient was well. I'm not quite sure for what reason. Um, do you see much C. diff as false positives? Yes, it's not a false positive. It's probably, so the test for C. diff detects C. diff toxin or toxin producing gene if it's a PCR. And it is certainly possible to have C. diff toxin expressing bacteria in your bowel and not be sick from it. And that doesn't need treatment. In fact, it's really common in, in babies and young children. So up to about sort of one year of age, about 30% of babies would have a positive C. diff test all the time. And then as you get older, it's, uh, you know, adults around 5% of people harbour toxigenic C. diff, but they're not sick with it. So if you happen to, if someone doesn't have diarrhoea, it doesn't matter what the C. diff test shows. Yeah. And it's interesting reflecting on the PCR. I just remember, I think I went to bed one night and woke up and it seemed like this explosion of sort of um, multiplex uh, PCRs was, was <laughs> happening. I just, well, I must have missed something here. But I thought you going to say explosion of diarrhoea. <laughs> But uh, just this sense bed. of, uh, <laughs> wow, this, this test everyone seems to be doing, am I missing out here? And I think sometimes that does drive us to uh, embrace a test that maybe can be used a little bit over-enthusiastically. All right, we'll finish with Stuart. Um, actually, just before we move on, I just want to say this is actually based on a real person I saw that was treated for blastocystis and ended up as a result with C. diff and got quite sick. So across the waiting room from Stuart sits Fazil, who's 75, he's a retired accountant, and he similarly had a um, colonoscopy a few years previously for fecal um, occult blood, and uh, there was no polyps, nothing sinister apart from extensive diverticulosis, and he uh, was reassured he, uh, he's normally fit and well, and he comes in to see a registrar with a couple of days of moderate left iliac fossa pain and mildly loose stool with no vomiting. The registrar examines him. He has a low-grade temperature. His uh, vital signs are normal. And he's got a, sure, he's got a tender left iliac fossa, but there's no peritonism, no rebound guarding on mass. And he's not too unwell with this, but he clearly is a little bit concerned about what's going on. So I'm interested to know what, I mean, we are setting this up as a case of diverticulitis, clearly, but I guess, you know, when, when you hear a case like this, uh, in the context of a talk on managing infectious uh, presentations in general practice. But what else would you need to think about? So, well, just put into chat, because I think it is, you know, it's sometimes, uh, well, we're going to be talking about uh, diverticulitis, but, you know, what can't you afford to miss in somebody like Fazil? Uh, retrocecal appendicitis, renal colic, UTI, very good. I think um, we need to have a broad differential. I spent a lot of time working in GP training and um, certainly my first question to a registrar who presents this case wouldn't be, uh, well, let's talk about how to manage acute diverticulitis in this man. It would be, well, what, you know, what have you just missed or what um, do you need to explore? Psoas abscess, ischemic colitis, there you go, Josh, a, a wide range of differentials. But let's assume uh, common things occur commonly and we, um, we do feel it's uh, most likely to be an acute diverticulitis. So how do we manage this man? Simple conservative management, uh, analgesically fluids and, and review. Do we give him empirical uh, oral augmentin? Um, does he should he go off and have a CT scan and um, and you know, maybe a CRP, ASR, full blood count and um, review him the next day? Do we do that plus give him some antibiotics just in case he doesn't deteriorate, or does this man go to ED? Um, so again, we've got about two thirds of his saying. Manage him conservatively, avoid the antibiotics, see what he's like in um, a couple of days. Your registrar is thinking, really? You know, I've seen these patients in ED and they can be really unwell. Um, and so, I don't know, I'm tempted to give some antibiotics, as 25% of you would do. And some of you would think about investigating him. So a bit of a spread. So, Josh, again, what, what's the latest uh, evidence around managing a patient with acute diverticulitis and indeed what yeah before that how, how do we sort of classify these types of patients in in primary care both primary and secondary care um and tertiary um, we sort of think about it as complicated or uncomplicated disease and complicated disease and th these definitions really come from what clinical trials have generally used but they're also sort of common sense clinical definitions so complicated means the patient's got bacteremia sepsis clinically, perforation or an 
an abscess more than five centimetres. And you'll note that most of these things need imaging to detect, but there are clinical correlates of these. The patient looks sick, they've got peritonism, etc. And complicated disease needs hospital admission and intravenous antibiotics and bowel rest. Uncomplicated disease is everything else. And if the uncomplicated disease is left-sided and the patient's not too unwell, there's no benefit of antibiotics. There have been two recent Northern European randomised trials uh, showing no difference in patients that were treated with antibiotics or placebo who had who met these criteria. But they in the clinical trials, if patients were not improving after 72 hours, then they went on to sort of rescue antibiotics, and that was about sort of 10% of people. However, if if people don't fit these criteria, so for example, they have right-sided disease, which is more likely to be complicated, or they're immunosuppressed, or that they're, they're unwell more unwell, then you might consider scanning them and giving them antibiotics up front. We've got a, a, an inquiring and probing question about how large were the RCTs? Were they, you know, were they big trials? Yeah, so they weren't like thousands of patients. They were both on the order of 500 patients in each trial. So some people, uh, you know, consider that that's not definitive evidence and they were both in Northern European countries as well. So not, maybe not as generalizable. But Australian therapeutic guidelines um, do really follow these trials and say that first line, don't give antibiotics, but review the patient. Um, but if you're clinically concerned, you're, you're worried about this patient for whatever reason, then it's also reasonable to give antibiotics up front. And I guess you'd be possibly a bold or brave GP to make a diagnosis of um, diverticulitis if it was right-sided in that, you know, it's, it's not typical, is it? And there'd be in somebody with an intact appendix, it could, could easily be that. Yes. What about colonoscopy at six weeks after every episode? Are they suggesting you should do a colonoscopy six weeks following an episode? Yeah, look, and I think that refers to the fact that um, probably at the index presentation of uh, diverticulitis when somebody hasn't had a previous, it, it's been demonstrated, and at that stage, I think we would be thinking about a formal diagnosis with a, a CT scan to follow up with the colonoscopy six weeks later to ensure that there's not a, an occult malignancy or um, uh, another cause. Is that maybe that's sort of slightly beyond your ken as a um, ID physician? Yeah, I don't. I mean, that sounds reasonable, but I don't know the evidence around. Yeah, that. I think th my understanding is that is is common practice, but certainly. You know, it doesn't have to happen repeatedly, obviously. And, yeah, just a, a reflection, um, move to manage uncomplicated appendicitis with IV antibiotics uh, and then discharge from an elective appendicectomy, how times have changed. Yes, it's interesting. Yeah. We're talking about upper respiratory tract infections, but I just wanted to make clear we purposely are kind of avoiding talking about COVID except where we touch on it here and there because there's just so much to talk about, plus we're all kind of sick of hearing about it at the moment. Um, and a lot of bread and butter conditions are being sort of uh, getting less attention than they should because of all the energy we're putting into COVID. Jill clearly is somebody who you, your hackles would be raised once you hear that she tells you that she's got um, four days ago started sneezing and has a runny nose and she's got this increasing cough and production of sputum. She tells you that she's mildly probably doing all this uh, while she's sitting in the car, if, uh, if you'd like my practice. Um, she's slightly short of breath. Um, she's had um, subjective fever for a couple of days. She just feels pretty miserable. So you get her in, I think, appropriately, and she has a temperature of 38. Saturations are okay. She's a little bit tachycardic, but her chest is clear, which, is, um, which was warranted you getting her in from the car probably. Josh did say we wouldn't talk too much about COVID, but we can't get away with um, not mentioning it. So, Josh, what just just you know the the, the barest whiff of a COVID update? So, yeah, I'm not sure I'd call it a COVID update, but just a good reminder that, and as would be at the forefront of all your all of your mind, someone who presents like Jill currently needs a COVID test because the and the testing criteria have really been the same for over a year, the national CDNA ones, but then each state has their own criteria, but they're basically the same, which is acute respiratory symptom. And the acute respiratory symptoms include a cough, sore throat, runny nose, shortness of breath, or acute loss of smell or taste, or an unexplained fever. So at the very early on in the pandemic, it was you had to have both fever and respiratory symptoms, and then it was changed to expanded criteria. So a fever which doesn't have an obvious alternative cause or acute respiratory symptoms. 
should have a COVID test. And, and obviously, sometimes asymptomatic patients need to be tested for special reasons like public health contact, etc. But we're talking about um, symptom indications here. So she should have a swab. Um, and the question often comes up about, um, you know, in the general practice and other settings, the person who's collecting the swab and seeing the patient, what PPE do they need to wear? And that's, it depends uh, what the epidemiology is in your area at the moment. So we have this, there's a concept called suspect COVID or suspected COVID. And that basically means um, the patient has symptoms, um, either fever or acute respiratory symptoms, and they have some kind of epidemiological criterion for COVID. And the epidemiological criteria, as it says there, are they were they've a known close or casual contact. There's a few other criteria that hardly apply these days, like has been overseas, for example. Or um, they're from an area with current community transmission. Now, last week in Newcastle, if someone was from Newcastle, they weren't a close contact and they had acute symptoms, that's not suspect COVID. So they would have a COVID swab, but we wouldn't do the full airborne PPE. This week, someone from Newcastle, we do consider suspect COVID just for having symptoms. So it depends on the local epidemiology, which PPE you wear. If they're a suspect COVID case, they need airborne precautions as well as droplet and contact. If they're not, they just need droplet and contact with a surgical mask. Now, Jill was coughing up phlegm um, so, and, and is a bit unwell. So the differential, the key differential really in her is acute, is it this acute bronchitis or is it pneumonia? So just to note, she doesn't have known COPD or asthma and exacerbation of COPD is a sort of different category. So both pneumonia and bronchitis can have purulent sputum. This alone doesn't mean they have a definite bacterial infection that needs antibiotics. And the features, the clinical features that correlate best with pneumonia as an infection inside the actual lung, not just the upper airways, are high ER fever, although that by itself isn't particularly useful, hypoxemia, tachycardia and tachypnea. And in fact, the WHO criteria in developing countries in children really just relies on tachypnea in someone who you suspect would has pneumonia, the definition is they've got tachypnea. Rigors and pleuritic chest pain are more likely to have pneumonia than bronchitis. Um, and then examining the patient, if they have bronchial breathing, crepitations that don't clear with coughing and dullness to percussion, especially if it's just focal. In acute, acute bronchitis is a self-limiting illness. Um, it generally subsides after the, the fever subsides after the first few days and then the cough slowly gets better after that. And you can, sometimes you do hear crackles, but they're upper airways transmitted noises. And when the patient coughs, they clear. So you called to check on her 48 hours later, um, having, I guess, asked her to have a COVID swab and reassuring her that it's likely a, an acute bronchitis with a viral or non-bacterial origin. I guess I'd just to just pick up on that point, I mean, I think a lot of registrars do get a bit anxious about pyrulent sputum and think, you know, that does equate to a bacterial infection. And I guess the other big thing that we're not going to talk about here is all the other factors. This is a, a clinical case that we've conceived for this talk, but all the, the, the pressure that a patient may put on, on a GP and uh, those, other, those other aspects. So a couple of days later, temperature is not as high, but um, she's still unwell. And this is a really common, I think, common presentation where we all may feel that we need to relent a bit or certainly a registrar with a little less experience may think, um, you know, I guess uh, it's about time to, to do something. Maybe this is a bit of a Dorothy Dixon for a group of experienced supervisors, but what do we do? Do we just say carry on? You know, do we, um, do we offer some antibiotics? And, you know, it might be that she's saying, well, I really don't want them or I'm saying, look, I, I need something because I feel so dreadful. Maybe her clinical features haven't changed much. Do we do a chest X-ray and, and treat her if, if necessary? Um, and I guess the role of a sputum culture here, uh, because that is something I think that, again, um, in developing this talk, I wasn't really confident about its role and certainly registrars may not. So just about half of our supervisors would um, just see this as an ongoing continuation natural history of acute bronchitis um, and a spectrum would offer some oral antibiotics or do a culture or maybe a chest X-ray and look for, a, uh, look for an underlying pneumonia. Interesting, because I can tell you from real-world data that about 70% of uh, GPs would treat this with anti or do treat this with antibiotics. We always like to think, I think, that the supervisor cohort 
and not the average GP. And I'm not saying that to be sycophantic. I think it's true. I think supervisors have an interest in education and, you know, being um, having uh, current knowledge. So perhaps we don't have a, a typical group here. But, yeah, yeah. And, and the reason we're talking so much about this is that registrar struggle and we know the, the um, epidemiology of these things is such that there's high prescription of antibiotics. So acute mucopyrrole and bronchitis, I've called it that full word just to remind us that it's normal to have yucky sputum in bronchitis. So there have been multiple randomised trials done comparing antibiotics with no antibiotics in this condition. And a recent meta-analysis of 11 of these, or not that recent, 2014, showed probably patients do get better slightly faster if you give them antibiotics, about one day shorter on average of symptoms. But there's no difference in the proportion who are completely recovered at 14 days and 28 days. And there's about 22%, you know, 1.2 times more likely to get adverse events if you get antibiotics than if you don't, which sort of seems obvious, but um, that's what the clinical trials showed. But even more compelling, a more recent prospective cohort study in US, sorry, in UK primary care setting looked at 28,000 patients with um, clinical syndrome of acute bronchitis. And some of them got antibiotics and some didn't. It wasn't randomized, but there was no difference in the proportion who ended up with a, a major complication. That is, they died or they had to be hospitalized. That, in fact, that was slightly higher in those who got antibiotics than those who didn't. So that's sort of reassuring for the registrar who says, oh, but what if I miss something and they end up dying or going to hospital because I didn't give them antibiotics? And just, just um, as a sort of broad, is that the same with ears and the same with, you know, pussy throats? And um, It's a little bit, it's sort of broadly the same, yes, but the evidence is a little bit different for each of the syndromes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, there are exceptions, for example, with acute otitis media. Yeah, yeah. But overall, I think there is that notion of just, you know, just, just to be safe. But I yeah. think what you're presenting here would suggest that it's, um, it's actually very uncommon for somebody to deteriorate. Yeah, particularly if you have the backup option of you're seeing them again in a few days and they're not deteriorating. Yeah. Now, the other two things to briefly touch on, which are not as evidence-based, is chest X-ray. It's not needed unless you clinically think the patient might have pneumonia. I don't know about, you know, primary care train, trainees and, and GP registrars and GPs these days, but certainly, you know, I'm a physician. I work a lot with physician trainees and junior doctors and the art of physical examination is not what it used to be. So people do tend to examine patients a lot less than they used to and, and rely on investigations too much. I mean, in the hospital setting, it's easy for us to get a chest X-ray, but really it's pretty in fact, physical examination is probably more sensitive than x-rays on the first day or two for pneumonia. So it's, this is one of the areas where it is quite useful to do a proper respiratory exam. And it's a really interesting time to say that, Josh, because um, literally having just come off a webinar where we're talking about um, triaging people with respiratory symptoms, trying not to get them to come in, you know, exam examining them in the car park, and you saying how important and how useful it is, and I would agree. I've seen a number of patients in recent weeks who have um, who have had pneumonia, and I base it on the clinical examination. So yeah, it's a it's a challenging time, I think. Yeah, that's true. I'm talking about in the perfect world. Yeah, um, yeah. And then sputum culture really is not useful, and this is a, a really overused test. So. Firstly, sputum is often spit. It's just saliva with a bit of stuff in it. And so when you culture that in the lab or you get, you know, mouth, the mouth is not a sterile site. There's hundreds of organisms in your mouth. So if you culture that in the lab, you'll get like 20 different colonies on the plate and it's a lot of work to identify all of them. So that's why the lab doesn't like it. If you've got a really high quality specimen, so like purulent sputum with hardly any saliva from deep in the lung, Sometimes you end up with pure growth of a particular organism. That doesn't really change anything. If the patient has the syndrome of bronchitis, I don't care what's in their sputum. It doesn't change whether they need antibiotics or not. We know there's bacteria there. There's always bacteria in sputum. And so unless they've got pneumonia, really, there's no place for a sputum culture in my view. So a couple of uh, questions on that. What if the patient had bronchiectasis and what if the patient was Aboriginal? So bronchiectasis is different, totally different scenario. Um, sputum cultures are useful in that setting, both CF and non-CF. 
um, to see what they're colonised with, basically, um, and when they're nat- So if someone with bronchiectasis is just finding pseudomonas or staph aureus in their sputum doesn't mean they need antibiotics at that point in time, but it means when they get a clinical flare-up, you need to target those organisms. And Aboriginal people, no. I mean, there's some exceptions in children later on in terms of antibiotics, but in terms of sputum culture, um, being Aboriginal wouldn't make a difference. Let's move on to our next um, little slight respiratory tangent. Um, influenza. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring that, this up is because in the context of COVID, uh, influenza is, you know, the poor cousin. And just to put it in context, um, since COVID began around 18 months or so ago, there's been 36,000 cases in Australia. And in the year before COVID hit, just the 12-month period, there were 10 times as many cases of influenza notified And we know that most influenza cases are not actually tested by PCR. So that's a vast underestimate. So flu is probably 20 to 50 times more common than COVID when we have a a proper flu year. On the other hand, it's much less dangerous. So um, the proportion who died, die is about 10 times lower for influenza. So you should think about influenza if the patient has an abrupt onset of high fever and cough. Those, that's the kind of typical presentation. And then oseltamivir is a much maligned drug because the evidence has been so controversial. There's clear evidence that it is of benefit, but the benefit is fairly minor. But it's particularly worth thinking about using it in those who are at higher risk of severe influenza disease, so pregnant women, obese people, immunosuppressed and over age 75. Or once they hit hospital, we routinely give them oseltamivir if it's within the first 72 hours and to prevent outbreaks. Now, Simon pointed out, which is something I've forgotten to think about, is this is not on the PBS, so the patient would have to pay for it. It's about $40 for a course. And then just a final note on flu. So there's a fantastic, really, ongoing study called Flu Tracking, which is led by the Population Health Group from Newcastle, and it's internationally renowned as a kind of crowdsourced public science um, project. So there's over 150,000 participants in this. Simon and I are two of them, but um, a lot of, a lot of not everyone's a doctor, obviously, it's just the whole community in all across Australia and now some other countries. Um, and every week you fill out a survey that takes about 30 seconds. Have you had cough and fever? And it'll ask a few other questions at the moment because of COVID. And, and from that um, tells us about what proportion are reporting an influenza-like illness. And you can see really interestingly that average over the last five years during winter is a peak in August, September, up to about 3% of of participants. But in 2020, that just peak never happened. 2021, it was starting to creep up, but I think it's going to go back down now that we're doing all this social distancing again. And if you're interested in helping some citizen science, there's the website to join. They're very clever. They send their email at about three in the morning on a Monday morning. So it's the first email in your inbox every week. And as Josh says, it takes about 20 seconds to complete. And it just feels like you're contributing. I've just come from a talk on PPE and respiratory infections in general practice. So all these patients are likely to be car park consults um, as opposed to sitting in the uh, the waiting room. But our next patient's one. He's 22 and he's had a sore throat for a couple of days. Uh, 48 hours, yep. Temperature to 38.6, so a decent temperature. And on examination, a few tender cervical lymph nodes. And he's otherwise well, no significant medical problems. And that is his throat. So obviously, um, pharyngeal injection, no tonsillar exudate, um, just a nasty looking red throat. And so I could, I did actually take out of this slide, apart from viral pharyngitis and group A strep. What is the differential? Because um, you, you, know, you might put that in. Uh, Maria's got in early with EBV. But, well, we, you know, again, you're not a group of registrars, but a registrar will maybe default to this being one of those two things. Um, and, you know, the first question I would always put to a registrar whenever they present a case like this is what else could it be? What, and we're getting lots of EBV, so that's possibly a condition that they may not entertain. Herpes stomatitis, gonorrhea, if applicable, that's a very good thought. Um, uh, maybe Malcolm's worked up in um, top end or areas where um, gonor- gonorrhea is uh, more prevalent or in a Sydney indeed, chlamydia. So, Josh, what types of things do we need to think about in, a, in an acute red throat? Well, it's quite a long list. I think I took this from an article on sore throat. Uh, epiglottitis 
fortunately I'm not seeing very much of it anymore. Diphtheria, I did ask Josh if, if he'd ever seen a case and he said, no, but I've got a good picture of one I've, I've presented to a colleague recently. So a long list and some non-infective causes and some medications um, can cause it. So I think uh, we'll move on, but just to think it's a broad differential. I've not seen diphtheria, and, uh, but I found this image. Um, I gather it's a very adherent plaque or exudate. Pseudomembrane. Pseudomembrane on the tonsils. I remember learning about it as a medical student. Quincy, I went to a talk once about Quincy and the ENT surgeon was telling us how to lance them in the rooms and I thought, my goodness, uh, <laughs> with John Hunter a kilometre away from my practice, I'll be sending them up. But obviously, you know, a complication of a um, streptococcal sore throat, a tonsillar abscess. Herpes stomatitis, somebody mentioned, which is, is important, um, commonly in, in young children, primary HSV uh, with multiple um, ulcers and vesicles in the mouth. And... I always like to put scarlet fever in because uh, I remember seeing a patient years and years ago, a, a child of about this age, whose mother was concerned. And I, um, after my, um, I'm sure, very thorough examination, reassured the, the, the parent that it was likely just to be a simple viral upper respiratory tract infection. And she said, you don't think it would be scarlet fever, do you? There's a bit of it going around the school. And I said, oh, let's just check that strawberry tongue again and the perioral pallor and the sandpaper rash and thought, yes, it probably might be. So uh, another cause of a red sore throat. But we are talking um, much more tonight about um, differentiating, I guess, well, maybe the, even that artificial divide between the viral and the bacterial sore throat, but certainly where antibiotics fit in, where investigations fit in, like throat swabs and um, how you might manage uh, one. So, yeah, thanks, Simon. I mean, I... I think it's a, it's, it is helpful and useful for patients to use this viral bacterial paradigm to explain in a simple way why antibiotics are not needed. But thinking about it um, in terms of the evidence and so on, it really doesn't matter if something's viral or bacterial because in sore throat, like in bronchitis, the evidence shows that that clinical syndrome, antibiotics are of minimal or no benefit. It doesn't matter what's causing it. About 10% of in adults and 20% in kids with sore throats are caused by group A strep. But even if you know it's group A strep, if the person's at low risk of complications and they're not severely ill, they're going to get better anyway. Their immune system will deal with it. But, and, it's, and as we've said, it's very hard to differentiate clinically completely between one or the other. There has been a lot of focus in the past on using Centaur criteria or using point of care antigen tests or that kind of thing to differentiate. But I, I think the, our thinking should move away from that in, into the clinical syndrome, which the clinical trials are based on. So high fever, tender adenopathy and an absence of a cough is, makes it more likely to be group A strep. I guess the other thing to say is there are other bacteria that can give you acute sore throat. Yes, gonorrhea, but, but other bacteria as well. And obviously a lot of different viruses too. And often both at the same time, you know, bacteria and viruses. So would you do a swab in Juan? A bit of a backstory. So we actually changed the image of Juan's throat, um, which was much more nasty, partly because we want to talk about treatment. And I must say, and I'll allow Josh to tell me the evidence and, and how we might approach this in teaching registrars. But when you see somebody who really has the temperature 39 and this sort of, you know, big, um, pussy tonsils and big nodes and, and feels dreadful, you know, you feel pretty tempted to give that person antibiotics and you register well too. So we wanted to make this a little less, less obvious in terms of um, whether you'd swab the person. So about 20% of people would do a throat swab and 80% um, and not. And, yeah, I, again, I, I must say I included this question as much for my own benefit because like sputum cultures, I've always been a little unclear as to where they fit in. What's the point? What, what do we do if we get a group C strep or certainly, you know, um, a, a less common bug? But, uh, or even indeed, if it just shows um, uh, not much at all, does that mean it's not group A strep? And then what does it matter? So, Josh, again, in your understanding of the literature, is that about what you'd imagine from a group of primary care practitioners? I think so. I mean, I, I'm... Not surprised that the majority of people say they would not um, do a swab. 
And and the reasons why, generally speaking, if you're not going to treat with antibiotics, it's not recommended, is that, what, firstly, as Simon said, not finding group A strep doesn't prove it's not that. Um, and finding it, more importantly, doesn't prove that it's causing the syndrome because around 15% of adults have group A strep in their throat all the time. Or not all the time, it comes and goes. So it can be... If you swab 100 people's throats every week, you'll find group A strep there 15% of the time. Same in, in vagina and low, lower general tract of women. You can find group A strep there about 10% of the time. So just finding it there doesn't mean it's necessarily causing the problem. And Josh, um, do you ever get called by GPs saying, I found Neisseria gonorrhea and uh, so Neisseria um, uh, meningitis in the throat? And, you know, what does this mean? Yeah, I have had calls like that and it's obviously... It causes a conundrum from a public health point of view, but you can get asymptomatic carriage of that, mm. um, obviously, and, and of other bacteria. There's, there are other Neisseria that are non, not gonorrhea and not meningitis. They're not pathogenic, so that sometimes come up on these swabs and people get really worried. Look, it, it's sort of a soft recommendation in therapeutic guidelines that if you're planning to give antibiotics, it's probably worthwhile collecting a throat swab um, and that's mainly in case something unexpected comes up or the patient develops a complication later on. So back to back to one, let's assume um, we didn't swab him. That's his throat. They, they're his, that's his clinical presentation. And as Josh has talked about, we're thinking about clinical syndromes. We're not, as a clinician, really trying to differentiate clinically whether it's a bacteria versus a virus. It's just how he presents with a, a sore throat. Yeah, and the question is, do... Do we treat him with antibiotics? And, or maybe more, you know, what do we advise our registrar? And, again, putting this into context, there's likely to be a whole range of things, patient pressure, you know, exams coming up, uh, the ski trip pending, all the sorts of things that we hear that might uh, bend, our, bend our arm a little bit. So we have about a quarter of people would say yes, two-thirds of people would say no, and a small number would use a backup script. So... Here is um, a script for penicillin and see how you travel over the next few days and if it's not getting better or certainly if it's getting worse, you can um, start some antibiotics. And again, Josh, is that, what, how does that match our understanding of the literature around prescription of antibiotics in you know, typical sore throats? Yeah, well, I mean, that's um, kind of uh, summarised well here and the therapeutic guidelines have this kind of handy decision tree, which is in sore throat. So if the patients are high risk of non suppurative complications, in other words, rheumatic fever, then they should be treated. So that's basically Aboriginal people ages 2 to 25 and Pacific Islanders as well. And that, that's primarily in rural and remote settings, but also in, in some urban settings, for example, overcrowding. So if they have high risk of rheumatic fever, they should be treated no matter what. And if they've got very severe sore throat, basically, they can't swallow properly, they can't eat and drink, they can't swallow their saliva, they need to go to hospital, they should have antibiotics up front. Otherwise, you can uh, offer symptomatic therapy and then tell them the pros and cons of antibiotics and only give antibiotics if they're not improving after two or three days. And yeah, this slide kind of repeats that a little bit. And, and just a plug to refer you to the, the Choosing Wisely Australia recommendations, of which is the number around prescription of antibiotics and management of infectious diseases. And this is about as uh, hackneyed a um, recommendation as you've seen, but it's there because um, it still needs to be talked about, and that's a try to avoid um, antibiotics in upper respiratory tract infections, of which this is a sore throat, but um, you get the gist. Family history of rheumatic fever, Josh. Is that a? Is that does that no. raise our uh, concerns? No. I, although most people with a family history of rheumatic fever are Aboriginal themselves, yeah. so yeah. they're at risk. But in the really rare scenario that you're not Aboriginal and there's a family history, that's not a risk factor. And somebody's asking about prednisone. Well, well look at that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, symptomatic management, what does that mean? Um, so non-steroidals are helpful and there's some evidence to support that makes symptoms improve faster. You know, lozenges containing local anaesthetics and antiseptics. Um, honey, there's some evidence, although mostly around cough rather than sore throat, that honey is helpful. Um, and corticosteroids, a single dose of either prednisone or dexamethasone is helpful if there's severe pain and difficulty swallowing and, 
in randomized trials, although in the trials, the patients got antibiotics at the same time. So if someone's severe enough to need steroids, I would generally give them antibiotics as well. There's a Cochrane review that was published in, uh, a few years ago now, actually by um, you know, some Australian uh, researchers and indeed GPs, Jeff Sperling, who's from Brisbane, and um, Chris Del Mar, where I guess where there's a sense that you know, there's a lack of confidence, and that may be our registrars, it may be ourselves, uh, that we're not confident a delayed antibiotic strategy may be acceptable um, where, uh, you know, we do, we do give a script and say use this um, as required and you will definitely be leading to more antibiotic prescription, but um, uh, it is going to be clearly less than um, if you just uh, routinely prescribe. So it isn't a bad strategy to use, you know, in terms of uh, engagement with the patient and, and long-term discussion around appropriate antibiotic um, usage. In fact, Josh, you're just uh, literally just saying that. It reminds me of a patient I spoke to today who said, um, so just this is an absolute aside, but she said, um, I just wanted to ask you, Simon, whether my husband could see you today. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. Because every time he gets his flu needle, he gets a bad cough that needs two courses of antibiotics. <laughs> and he only had one this time round, and he's still sick. And so could, he needs to come in for his second one. And I thought, <laughs> man, there's so many misunderstandings there to unpack. This is a case of Alicia, who's five, and Alicia actually presents with a thing called persistent bacterial bronchitis, which I was really keen to include just at the end of this talk because it was something when I was uh, presenting on it a couple of years ago as part of the um, uh, uh, clinical update, I really didn't know much about. And Josh also would profess not to be a, um, a paediatrician, but, um, yeah, I thought we just should, should finish on this as something that may be less familiar, certainly to your registrars and maybe to yourselves. So what, what can you tell us about um, this condition, Josh? So it's only been really recently described and recognised to be a real thing in the last five to ten years. And by Australian researchers, actually, the main one of which is, works with me at Menzies in Darwin and Chain, some children have this syndrome of, uh, persistent bacterial bronchitis, which means a wet cough that lasts more than four weeks. And in those particular kids, if you don't treat it, um, a su substantial proportion go on to get bronchiectasis. And if you do treat it with a course of antibiotics, it, it prevents that in most cases. So one really important thing is it's wet cough. So dry, persistent dry cough is very common in kids because post-viral cough, and then they get another virus and another virus, so they've always got a post-viral cough. That's dry. A wet cough, which in kids that are old enough to spit out their phlegm, means they're spitting out phlegm. And in younger kids that swallow their phlegm, that's rattly and, and wet sounding. Um, more than four weeks, you should think about this syndrome. And there, there is guidance in antibiotic guidelines about that. But it's basically a course of augmentin if they're not allergic to it. There's a very good chapter or a very good section in, um, in t therapeutic guidelines, which I would point you to. And I must say I saw a child recently who I was suspicious had this and it was very useful to kind of read, read about it at the time. And I think the point being that this is a, uh, an, an indication for antibiotics. It's an indication for um, amoxicillin clavulanic acid and it's also an indication for an extended course. So where we've, the message very much is often around not prescribing anything and certainly nothing that's um, too broad spectrum. Um, this, is, this is different. Sorry, so, I know you've put a question mark on this, should be prescribing consultation with a paediatrician, and I agree this is an impractical example of, of guidelines that are written by specialists. Like, I, I think that's a bit dumb. Uh, if they're allergic to augmentin, then what? You could use um, cephalexin and cephaclor. Yep. probably are the two leading ones I'd use. We were going to briefly, we don't need to talk about these because we've actually, the red ones we covered in the first webinar and the blue ones we've talked about today, the res respiratory tract infections and fecal pathogens, and the fifth one we haven't really talked about, but that's around, uh, you know, Ross River virus serology, CMV serology and things like that being positive in a large proportion of the population. So a lot of Thai people also have positive serology for those things and it's not very useful. And really just a plug to, again, those of you who were on last week, we talked about Choosing Wisely Australia. If you weren't here or you're not aware of it, um, just Google Choosing Wisely Australia clinical recommendations, and these are the ACID ones. 
but there are a whole range from a whole um, breadth of uh, other clinical disciplines. We're talking about infectious diseases here tonight, but um, lots of really good evidence-based recommendations for clinical practice. Can I refer you, and indeed the follow-up email and the evaluation will point you to um, the GPSA resources uh, that are relevant to the topics we've talked about. So teaching plans on all those conditions, uh, including a brand new one that I wrote on the weekend and Josh oversaw um, on diverticulitis, so um, something to talk to your registrars about. Clearly therapeutic guidelines as the, I guess, the primary resource for antibiotic um, management. And somebody actually mentioned the NPS resources, and I must say um, they are excellent. And if you're not a member of NPS Medicine Wise, um, get on their website and get, um, get, get on their subscription and you will, uh, you'll receive their excellent um, educational stuff, including Australian Prescriber. Usual acknowledgement um, from GPSA to the Australian government for supporting educational events like these under the Australian General Practice Training Program. Um, but my last... Uh, I think duty is really just to thank Josh, who I think from the um, flurry of thank yous and I guess uh, comments saying how practical and how useful this was, it's not very common we have somebody come along two weeks in a row and give their time like you have, but thank you so very much. Uh, it's, it's just great to pick your, your brain and um, get some really practical um, information and, and evidence around how to manage these common presentations in practice. Thanks, Simon. I've enjoyed doing it. I always learn a lot too when I'm liaising with general practice. So thanks all very much. Have a, uh, a good evening and look forward to seeing you at an upcoming webinar. All the very best. <laughs>